Um, we want to know where the content itself resides, where what we're competing with against uh, the programmer itself, who used to not be a competitor, they were just a supplier. Now they're a supplier and a competitor. So what are the rights uh, digitally and what do we get and what are, what are they trying to keep for themselves and how do we square that? I mean, I think what you saw in the Charter Disney deal, which was, I think, a watershed uh, deal for the industry is that, and we were out here fighting the same thing years ago. We were trying to get it such that whatever the D2C product was, the direct consumer product was in particular programmer, that our customers were already getting Oh, the, most of those channels and that content through their subscription to us would have free access to their direct consumer product. And we were out there first to try to get those that what we call the don't pay twice principle. And we got coupons effectively for customers who wanted to subscribe to those direct consumer products from the likes of uh, Discovery Plus, from the likes of AMC Plus, Paramount Plus, Peacock where we got a 40% off coupon for our customers. Charter got a 100% off coupon and they're plugging in those, those DTC products as part of the subscription now um, into their uh, subscription for Spectrum. That, that was an important move. And in order to make room for that, they also called out a lot of what I'd call longer tail channels or secondary or tertiary channels of, of the particular portfolios of these, of these programmers that don't get a lot of viewership. They're really just jammed into deals to get money out of distributors. The price of pay TV has gotten too high. There are hobbies for these programming shops that don't throw off a lot of cash yet. anyway. Those, those should go away and we should retrench the programming into the channels that they have that are the flagship channels. And too often I'm seeing the same bit of content ported across multiple channels of a particular portfolio. You see Monday Night Football, that used to be exclusively in ESPN going to ABC. I, you, you see, uh, you know, the Manning cast as it relates to that as well. So ESPN to ESPN, ABC are all getting effectively the same game with different variations of it. Not to pick on ESPN, Disney, they're not alone. You see a lot of duplicate broadcasts across portfolios and we don't need to pay twice for that kind of stuff. The shell game of programming cost needs to end and we need to get more rationalized pricing so that we keep more customers in the pay TV ecosystem. And if we don't, then the programmers who are going to go direct to consumer and lose customers from us now have to, they all, if we lose one customer, every one of the major programming shops needs to pick up uh, that subscription for that customer with their D2C products. And we know that's not going to happen. It just isn't. So uh, it's kind of, crazy that we've gotten to this point and it doesn't seem like logic prevailed in how program deals were done but uh here we are and now we have to try to re-rationalize this and i think the charter disney deal was a good first step in towards reconstituting how these deals are done in a way that are most advantageous for customers you did kind of answer it but i, I want to ask sort of an obvious question which is like how is this going to help you at direct tv is this going to in your opinion going to stem cord cutting Actually, your direct TV, do you call it cord cutting? What do you call it? <laughs> we do, we do. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fair, it's a, maybe it's a, a misnomer, but yeah, we think of it as cord cutting or, or churn really, I guess. Right, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Think of it as churn. We don't like that. Churn is not a good thing. And so if we can come to the table in a renewal, like you asked, what are the important things? I don't think I fully answered your question, but there's a myriad of different things. If we can provide subscriptions to D2C products that they didn't have previously, that's value add that we can get back to customers to then say, please stay with us because we're trying to give you more value than what you had previously with us. Do you have a number internally where you think the pay TV universe is going to sort of level out at? Look, we've seen all kinds of different reports. I think you see ranges between 40 and 60% as being sort of the, the bottom. And it's hard to know if that's correct or not, but that's the best guesses by the, the analysts who cover our industry. But prices keep going the way they're going. Maybe that's underestimating the bottom. Because if you're if you're selling hamburgers and you were charging 10 bucks, you know, 10 years ago and now the hamburger's 50 bucks, maybe people aren't going to eat hamburgers. <laughs> yeah. Give me a hot dog. Yeah. yeah you are. So if there are other substitutes like the hot dog that you're bringing up, the substitutes are bite-sized portions of D2C products that people could subscribe to or or getting content through Amazon Prime that they get, they're largely getting an Amazon Prime subscription for free shipping, opportunistically getting content now 
and getting things such as Thursday Night Football as part of that subscription. There's a value add that's happening with Amazon. There are other ways for people to get to content that are different than the way probably you and me grew up watching. At least I know I did. I watched ESPN cycle through multiple versions of Sports Center. I used to watch um, you know, my local team, my Braves play, or I watch my Bulldogs play, or I watch my Hawks play, or uh, the threaded Falcons. Um, I'd watch those teams play, and then I'd watch the ensuing sports, local sports recap of that game and, and games, and then I'd watch Sports Center to see how those things plugged in. And I don't think millennials watch sports to the same degree. They certainly don't watch TV to the same degree. Um, we didn't grow up with TikTok, but that's a phenomenon that people like to watch, and it gets a lot of eyeballs. So people have the uh, time is really the measurement that's shared across all these things. And they spend their time in different things than just linear TV. And if we price linear TV too expensively, you're almost forcing their hand to go watch it in different, spend their time with their eyeballs doing different things than watching pay TV. You know, what's a, what, what I find to be uh, interesting about this is as I've been covering this, it seems to me that Fox and ESPN have really been trying to uh, support the cable bundle. So even if Monday Night Football has sort of leaked out to ABC, I mean, it's a broadcast channel, of course, you can get, get it with an antenna, but it's still somewhat w- within the bundle. You look at like uh, NBC, which uh, puts Sunday Night Football on Peacock or CBS, which uh, puts you know their NFL on Paramount Plus. Uh, I, that's, a, that's different than what ESPN is doing, but it doesn't sound like you view it much differently. No, I do. I mean, I, I think... Um, and Fox and Disney are the first ones to tout the fact that they are not the bad actors in, in the D2C regard, because in, objectively, Disney Plus and ESPN Plus are not pure, you know, replicate streams of Disney, the Disney Channel and ESPN. They're different pieces of content, whereas what you get in Peacock and what you get in Paramount Plus are largely duplicative of what our experience is and all the channels that we license all the way to the broadcast channel. Uh, the one thing that they do maybe that's even worse though, is they, they take certain pieces of exclusive content uh, to put into those D2C experiences that then are further driving people away from pay TV to go subscribe to those particular experiences. There's going to be a wildcard game in Peacock that won't be available on pay TV. That's not a good thing. And so those are the kind of things that we have to rectify in, in our upcoming deals so that the kind of behavior doesn't happen. Cause we're, they're probably being funded 100% through our, the content licensing of our deals. And the unique thing about Charter doing that was Charter had me believing, at least, that they were prepared to go as a broadband company. You know, that, okay, we we are going to uh, shed video. You, of course, at DirecTV, you can't do that. Yeah, we're a pure play video provider. So we don't have the ability to point people uh, to the broadband subscription of ours. And I, and I don't think um, Charter was, you know, playing a game. I really do believe that they were at the point of indifference where they probably make just as much, if not more money for a customer who's just a broadband customer versus a broadband and video. I think broadband has been subsidizing video for years and they kind of hit the point of it doesn't make sense anymore for video to be subsidized for broadband. We'll cut the cord and let you guys all then uh, fight for yourselves to see who's going to get to your direct consumer subscription. And so um, I, I don't think it was a bluff. I think it was very real. And I think that's important uh, as, a, as a check against the programmers to get more rational in their pricing to realize that you that none of them, not one of them could exist if it was just D to C only because not everybody watches ESPN. Not everybody watches Fox News. Not everybody watches a USA or Paramount channel. They they just don't. And but but through our subscriptions, they pay we pay for every single one of those customers who has in their package those particular channels. And so uh this buffet model that uh they enjoy, if it's a a la carte model, it's a it's a whole different game of trying to get these customers and then servicing them, which is another thing that they don't really have a lot of experience with. Um, and it's not a, it's not an easy part of what we do and what we provide in the value chain. 